Okay, welcome everyone to our empathy circle uh, with empathy activists. And when I say empathy activists, I mean uh, people committed to practicing empathy, teaching it, have written books about it, or really trying to, you know, really putting a lot of energy into uh, promoting the value of empathy. And our topic today in this uh, discussion is how might we build the empathy movement? And we're going to be going for about uh, two hours. And the uh, the sort of the purpose of these is to get empathy activists together to start talking to each other, as well as uh, kind of generate ideas that we can maybe work on together and sort of model a, an empathic way of, of holding a dialogue. And if you're an empathy activist out there and you're watching this and you'd like to take part in one of these, do reach out to me. You know, my emails in, in the in the. Uh, chat, not the chat, but the description below, contact me, you can take a part uh, in, in one of these dialogues. And we're going to be using the empathy circle practice, which I find is the most effective sort of first step gateway practice uh, to uh, sort of building empathy skills and as a practice. And so we're gonna be using that to model how to do uh, uh, good empathic listening. Uh, everyone here pretty much knows what the process is and how it works. Um, if you're, if you, there's some, there'll also be just it's description and links to the how to to do the empathy circle practice down in the uh, in in the uh, description. So we're going to start. We're just going to go around each, introduce ourselves. You know where we're located. Maybe you know a half a minute or so just to say where you are, what we, what you're doing with empathy. And we'll just do a quick introduction, then we'll kind of jump in into the process. And so to model that, uh, I'm Edwin Rutch. I'm director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. I've been working for about 14 years on doing all kinds of different projects on, uh, on empathy, creating more empathy in the world. Almost of those books there, three or four rows are empathy books. I've interviewed most of the authors, put those interviews online. We do empathy tents, uh, social media, and all kinds of different uh, uh, projects uh, to, to promote empathy, more empathy in the world. So uh, Leanne, would you like to do a little introduction? Yeah, um, my name's Leanne Butterworth. I'm in Brisbane, Australia. So it's 8 a.m. here. And I have a social enterprise called Empathy First. So we do empathy training. I have the Professional Empathy Podcast, where I interview professionals um, and people with different lived experience about the role of empathy, both for them and from them, for their clients or their patients. Uh, I also lecture social enterprise at university and uh, learning and development in social enterprise. And to me, the heart of social enterprise is empathy. So um, yeah, that's me. And this is my first empathy circle. So thank you so much for, um, for inviting me. Sure. Thanks for uh, taking part. Uh, Wayne, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, uh, kia ora. Um, so first of all, that's a, a welcome in Māori. Um, so that's a, a hello to uh, to you both and to those who are watching. Um, I'm a uh, an empathy researcher. Uh, I did my uh, doctoral research on empathy within synchronous multimedia conferencing. So that's empathy within this sort of an environment. Um, so post that, I, I looked at empathy within a bicultural lens. So looking at uh, indigenous examples of uh, how an, an understanding of empathy and how empathy develops. And uh, some of the work I also do, some of the practical work I do is I work as a kaitiaki, which is student support for special needs students. So I do that uh, one or two days a week down at a special education school. So what I've found is um, empathy obviously is a, a key social relational mechanism. And what I've found is that the use of an empathy circle is one of the best ways to develop those skills that you need to be um, more proficient at being em empathic with other people um, through the uh, empathic listening and empathic communication. So very excited by uh, what you've been doing, Edwin. Um, and uh, the more we can push this out into the world, the better. Well, great. So glad you're both taking part. 
Uh, you're both down under. I'm in California, so it's great to connect with uh, New Zealand and, and Australia uh, for this discussion. So let me just restate the, the question, which is how might we build the empathy movement or whatever is alive for you? So anything sort of on your mind, you're welcome to uh, uh, speak about that. We're going to have five minute turns and uh, I'll be kind of just holding up a little sign when your time is up. At that point, you just sort of wrap up what you're saying, get your final reflection, and uh, then it becomes a listener's turn to select someone else to speak to. So I can be the first listener. Uh, uh, Leanne, perhaps since uh, this is your first time doing it, you can speak and then then you'll be able to watch us uh, do, Wayne and I do it later on uh, before you okay. have to do the listening, which is a harder part. Okay. So I'm, yeah, okay. go ahead. All right, wish me luck. Um, Good luck. <laughs> all right, <laughs> how can we build the empathy movement? To me, that's a big one, especially in Australia, because I don't feel like we're an empathetic culture. I don't feel like we've embraced empathy. I feel like empathy is misunderstood in Australia. So it feels like building a culture of empathy or a, a movement of empathy has to come from an understanding first. Okay, can I reflect that? So I'm hearing that uh, you think it's a good topic and you're seeing that you're in Australia and you just feel that the culture is sort of not very empathic. And to really get that sort of a movement started, people have to really have a understanding of what empathy is. Yeah, and they have to be open to it. So I feel like because we don't talk about it a lot, it's not something that's taught in schools. We have a misunderstanding of what it actually is. And I use the three different types when I'm talking about empathy. And when people don't understand something, they fear it. And when they fear it, they avoid it. Mm. And then they mock it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when I see comments online about people who fundamentally don't understand what empathy is, they then push away from it. They reject it. They mock it and ridicule it. So I feel like there's a there's a... Uh, an information or a, an awareness piece there that has to happen first before people can truly embrace it. Mm, so you're saying that people really, well, in the culture, there needs to be a deeper understanding of what empathy is before they can really embrace it. And if they don't understand it, they maybe fear it. And if they fear it, they, they're more likely to attack it or just try to avoid it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's interesting because when I run workshops I will ask people before the workshop like what does empathy mean to you and I'll get so many different definitions that some people are like oh it's all feeling the feelings and it's just warm fuzzies and other people who talk about active listening and people who go oh it's putting yourself in other somebody else's shoes and it's hard to feel empathy if you've never been through it and because everybody's talking about all these different pieces of the puzzle when they try to then apply it to let's say empathy and design and you've got one person talking about cognitive and one person talking about emotional. They're talking about two very different concepts. So then they don't kind of get anywhere and go, oh, that was a waste of time. So it's, to me, the movement has to start with this collective understanding of what it is to start with. And then we can excite people and inspire them and go, right, now here's the ways and here's... Um, here's what's happening and here's how you embrace it and here's how to do it in a healthy way. Because that's the other piece I think is missing is empathy being healthy empathy, which is not burning out, which is not give, 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 which is not making assumptions, which is not, um, yeah, like losing yourself or sympathy. So this concept to me of healthy empathy and putting a positive self-care spin on it I find then connects better with people than just empathy because they go oh I have so much going on I don't have the capacity to feel more life's already full I'm like I'm not asking you to do that so okay, coming back like that that's yep, quite a yep. lot there so I gotta give a little bit of space uh so it's again with this thing of a definition that sounds like you're not seeing you the definition seems people seem see the definitions all over the place 
And when they're talking about empathy, they're kind of talking past each other. And because of that, it sounds like you would like to see a clear definition or mutual understanding because you sort of need that if you're going to be working at uh, fostering empathy, you got to ha have a clear understanding of what you're saying and uh, so you can understand each other. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why, like any time I teach anything related to empathy, whether it's writing or communicating or design, it always starts with, well, what are the three types of empathy? Let's break it down. Let's look at it. Now let's put it back together and put it back together in a way that feels um, vulnerable, but feels safe as well. I don't want people to burn out doing this. I don't want people to um, yeah, not enjoy it because it's meant to be a positive, happy, connecting mm -hmm. experience and not something to be afraid or pushed away. Mm -hmm. So you'd really like to have empathy be something that's a positive, kind of a healing positive, not something that they're afraid of. And uh, so, yeah, I guess that's the, the core of it. And that was the five minutes. Did okay. I kind of get that? Did I... Yeah, definitely. Okay, definitely. great. Hopefully. Um, then uh, I'll speak to Wayne. Hit the clock here. Wayne. Um, yeah, I'm so glad that Leanne kind of mentioned this because that was sort of my topic that I wanted to mention too, was uh, the definition. The definition is such a mess that I, I'm starting a project on creating a definition that kind of that I've been sort of using, but getting really clear about it and developing a, a training around it. So I'm very, feel a lot of resonance with Leanne about that. So, um... Edwin, what I what I heard you uh, saying was that uh, you were quite excited that uh, that Leanne brought that aspect of the topic up because that's an area that you're interested in and something that you're wanting to develop over time. And Leanne did mention three aspects of empathy. I think she's meaning affective, cognitive, and maybe compassionate, which I think that that model is very confusing. I, I and and so I think we need a different model. Uh, besides that model, because it, it it's inherently contradict has inherently contradictory components to it. So what I heard you saying is that uh, your understanding of what Leanne was uh, bringing forward was affective, uh, cognitive, and and compassionate empathy, and for you that that model of empathy is a little bit confusing, and you would like to bring forth or explore the development of a, a new model of empathy. And uh, the, the foundation of the model I'm looking at is based on the work of Carl Rogers, who I think really uh, described empathy and really worked for, on it for like 40 years and just had a real good sort of a foundational explanation of sort of a company listening in to someone you know, else and kind of being present with them. And it actually is modeled in the empathics in the empathy circle that you're listening to me empathizing into uh, my experience right now. So we're actually modeling it in this empathy circle. Yeah. So what you're you're interested in is the is the work of Rogers, um, because he had a better understanding of the uh, the key element, I guess, of empathy, which is uh, listening in or or being with. Uh, somebody else. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we're actually modeling it in the empathy circle. So <clears throat> with the definition that we're doing, whatever definition, I would like to see it modeled in the empathy circle. Point to what is happening in the empathy circle to the word, whatever word concept you're using to show it. Yeah, so so the the definition that is established, you'd like to see it modelled within the empathy circle, um, and so that people can see that developing. Yeah, and you can actually experience it. You can take part in an experience in the empathy circle and actually feel the experience. So, if if you're experiencing empathy, empathizing into someone else, you can tell me like what your experience is as you listen and you know sense into my experience. Yeah, so a key aspect of that is being able to, the other, the listener, being able to experience into 
um, the experience of the speaker, which is really the cornerstone of of empathy itself. And the empathy circle. Again, it's like, let's yeah. ground our definitions in this empathy circle. So it's a tangible foundation of what the heck we're talking about. <laughs> Mm. So it's it's grounded in the experience of the empathy circle itself. So the empathy circle becomes a um, a model in itself of what empathy is. An experiential model, yeah, actually. Yeah. So and for so for example, that model with affective cognitive empathy, that model is all kind of people are actually defining that differently. But one of the ways they define it and say is empathy is your reaction to when you sense somebody in their feelings, your reaction is what they call empathy, which I don't think so. I think that the, the empathy is the sensing into, it's not you, Wayne, your reaction uh, to listening. Yeah, so, so you think the understanding should be the, the sensing into uh, the other person's um, experience or, or understandings, rather than my react or the, the listener's reaction to that, what is being said. Yeah, that's my time, feel fully heard, thanks. Okay, um, Leanne, would you like to be my, my listener? Yes. <laughs> okay, so what I'd like to, to do is now talk about the experiences that are part of this model. Okay, um, sorry, I was losing. Um, you would like to, so bring together what it is that Edward and I have spoken about into how we use that in an empathy model, is that right? No, more, more of what I'm going to talk about now is the aspects of the empathy circle mm -hmm. and how they may be um, developed into a model. Oh, okay. So looking at the empathy circle and how you can develop that into a model that's easily communicated. Is that what you mean? Yeah. No, yeah. Replicated. So if I go through each part, first of all, we started off with Leanne, you was, you were the speaker and Edward yep. was the listener and yep. I was the passive watcher at the side. Now a big part of empathy, the empathy circle is that I had this incredible desire to want to make comment while you were speaking which is a something that's really big in the empathy circle is the passive listener experiencing that desire but then learning to resist yeah so that the speaker gets the full opportunity and doesn't get butted in with so that's that's the first role all right, so in an empathy circle, we've got an active speaker, and we've got an active listener, and the role of the passive listener can actually be quite difficult because we're fighting against those urges to want to, to want to say something and to want to butt in. So looking at the role of empathy within that passive listener. Is that right? Yes, yes, okay. it, that's good. The second role that I want to talk about is the speaker. Which, which I have that role now. Now, prior to doing empathy circles, I would speak, and in fact, my initial empathy circles, my aha moment was realizing that I wasn't actually thinking about the responder. I was talking for ages. Now, I stop. So when we're, it changes, so by the sound of it, it changes how we speak because instead of speaking to get all of our points across, we speak with respect to the active listener and we cut it short so that they can then consolidate and paraphrase back to us. So it changes how we communicate. Yes. The other thing is that you become almost an active listener when you're a speaker because you're mindful of the fact that the listener has to be able to um, report back to you what they've heard, but also you've got to be able to keep it short enough so that they can. Yeah. So as an active speaker, you 
are not only being mindful of what it is that you're saying, but you're mindful of how you're saying it because the active listener has to uh, paraphrase it. So you're adapting how you speak and using mindfulness when you speak so that there's that two-way line of communication. It's not just I'm venting onto you. Yes. So in a way, what the empathy circle is doing, um, often we think about the person who's listening is the one who is being empathic. Mm. But in fact, there's a role and responsibility of the speaker yeah. to be empathic by listening to how well the speaker, uh, sorry, the listener is able to listen and then adjusting them their um, conversation to match. Yeah. So if I'm hearing you right, it's no longer okay to put all of the responsibility on the listener to make sense of it but the putting half of the responsibility on the speaker to speak in a way that they know makes sense that shows respect for the active listener in order to I guess respond in a way that is mutually beneficial yes now if I switch over to the third role which is the active listener um, which I was doing when Edwin was talking, is that I realized when I first started doing empathy circles that I don't actually listen. Um, that my mind wanders off all over the place. And when the speaker speaks for a little bit long, you're going, ah, I can't, I can't paraphrase it all. So it develops that active listening skill that most people don't have. So if I'm hearing you correctly, the active listener has to retrain in order to, I guess, suppress that wanting to butt in and wanting to, but also they have to practice how they're listening because if it goes on a little bit long, then we have to change how we paraphrase and we have to change what it is that we're retaining. So instead of thinking about what it is that you're going to say next, you're listening and framing and trying to understand. But then when it goes on a little bit longer, that actually makes it more difficult. Is that mm. right? Oh, we've been time. Okay. So that's that's quite good because now we've gone around all the the components of an empathy circle. So which draws back to what Edwin was talking about is- That, that was our time, sorry. So, it's, so bringing uh, it together. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Oh. so we'll continue, you have more time. So Leanne, now you can choose either me or Wayne, you can sort of mix it up. You, you spoke to me last time, if you wanna to speak to Wayne, you can do that. So it's your choice who you wanna to speak to in your um, five minutes. We just keep woo. going like this, yeah. So who okay, are you speaking so to? I'm going to choose Wayne. I don't know where I am. Yeah. So this empathy circle. So I haven't seen this used before. Um, not in not in real person. I've seen it online. I've seen it online in some of the work that Edwin's done. What? And I want to ask questions. I don't know. Okay. I'm going to spitball for a while because when I want to see how this would apply for kids and I know that Wayne you said that you work with special needs kids okay I'm going to pause <laughs> okay so what I not only heard from you but I sensed from you as well is a real trying to bring things together is that you you that this is a new thing for you and you're, what you're wanting to do is ultimately explore this and then see how it works for, for students, for, for children. Yeah, yeah. because I have a 10-year-old and an 11-year-old and I try as hard as I can. We talk about empathy. We talk about all, all sorts of things. They hear all the things. But if we're talking about how do we build a movement of empathy, it feels like having these conversations in a safe practicable like a model way that you spoke about Wayne it feels like kids especially like this 
10 and 11, even younger, would be the perfect candidates for practicing these skills. So what I heard you say is that you've got a, a 11 and a 12 year old boys and you try and, and discuss empathy with them. But what you're seeing is that, that this um, structure of the empathy circle and, and the skills that they learn there, it seems the ideal place to build that movement with the students or with the children. It feels like, so I've got a 10-year-old girl and an 11-year-old boy. And yeah, because what I'm feeling in this is, I mean, you, may, you mentioned mindfulness a minute ago. It feels very calm and it feels very safe. So I don't feel like, it doesn't feel like there's any room for judgment. It doesn't feel like there's any room for confusion or ridicule because I have the opportunity to, I guess, give that clarification if I don't feel heard and understood. Because at the end of the day, we want the behavior for people to feel heard. Okay, so what I heard is you've got a 11 year old daughter and a 12 year old son. Um, and uh, can you um, sort of go through again what you talked about then? Um, I just missed yeah. it. So 10 year old girl, 11 year old boy. <laughs> and when we're going through this process, I can, I feel very calm and I feel very safe. I feel sometimes when we have to speak about things that we're unsure of, our uh, heart rate goes up and we get a bit stressed. Whereas right now I'm like, I'm okay with this. I'm okay to talk about this stuff because I know that I'm not going to be judged or ridiculed. Your sole purpose is to understand what I'm saying, not to um, yeah, judge what I'm saying. So it feels very safe, which feels very... Um, useful in that child space okay so a 10 year old daughter and yes. an 11 year old son yes. and what you feel is in this environment because the stage is yours you feel very safe you feel very unjudged because you've got you you're not getting exposed to any comment while you're working through things so therefore, it's a safe environment for you to develop and share your thoughts and understandings. And mm. therefore, it seems an ideal place to develop those skills with children. Yeah, absolutely. Because like you were saying before, those three different roles have their own challenges and they have their own opportunities for growth and they have their own unique skills that you require as the passive listener and as the active listener and as the active speaker you you change and you become very mindful of your own emotions and of your own reactions so those three skills yes we can teach them to adults but I'm I guess I'm just trying to put the pieces together so I can try and use this in a way that is useful for me and my kids and the people that I work with, yes, broader, but my mind is going to my kids first and foremost, because if we're creating a movement. Yeah, so what you're seeing is, is a key element of this is each one of the roles has specific skills and, and competencies. And because we're building those skills and competencies, it seems an ideal place to do that is with children. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Wayne, your turn. And uh, I just changed it to six minutes. So we have a little bit more time to explore ideas each. So I just gave- Can I ask a question? Six. Can I ask a question yeah, though? Sure. When we're doing this, it, it's, it's interesting because I don't feel like I need to have the answers before I start speaking. I feel like I can- come up with the answers as we're going and I don't have to have the correct answer or I don't need to know where I'm going at the beginning of the six minutes because we can kind of play with it 
And yeah, so I'll, I'll hold cut off there. When it's your turn, oh, sorry, you, can, you can talk perfect. about it. You can say all that that you're oh, saying. Okay. If it's a technical <laughs> question, then maybe we'll take stop. But within the format of the circle, you know, bring up really? anything. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Wayne? Sorry. Um, I feel very, very excited. Who are you speaking because, to? Oh, sorry. Um, I might go to you, Edwin. Okay, listening. You're, I'm hearing you're uh, really excited. Yeah, I'm really, really excited now because I can see Leanne. I can feel, I can sense Leanne's, Leanne's excitement and Leanne's aha moments as she's, as she's learning, as, as she's undergoing experiential learning mm -hmm. rather so than informational learning. Yeah, so you're you're like really excited because you can sense Leanne's aha moments because she's exper doing experiential learning instead of just a uh, lecture or something. And it, that kind of excites you to see her growth and learning. Yeah, because that's what uh, attracted me to empathy circles at the very beginning is that I had done a lot of, of academic um, looking in and exploring what empathy was, but I hadn't actually experienced at a deeper level the components of empathy itself. So you got excited too when you started learning the empathy circle practice because the experiential component, because you, you hadn't really experienced that because you'd done more of the academic sort of understanding, not the experiential. I think another thing that the empathy circle allows you to do is just as you said, Leanne, that you don't need the answer when you start talking. You're developing the understanding of empathy as you're taking on each of the roles. Mm -hmm. So, so as Leanne mentioned, that she she's sort of thinking in the moment, and the empathy circle sort of gives that space to think in the moment about just what's what's arising for you. Is that sort of? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. no, that's very good. Um, so, therefore, if we're looking about taking empathy th forward, I, I think you're probably hitting the nail on the head. Uh, Leanne, because for a lot of, for most people, this is a complete change in cognitive communication. Um, and obviously the, the ones who are going to take on quicker are the ones who are developing those uh, neurological connections most, which tends to be our youth. Um, mm. Yeah, so in terms of creating like a movement, uh, this is like a different approach. And the people who can sort of make that shift, that kind of a deep shift are going to be the youth. So you think Leanne's really on the mark there with, hey, we got to get this to the youth. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, I the aha moments I had in each of the three roles and looking at the empathy circle as a mechanism to develop those capacities. I also work with students in mainstream schools, not only developing the skills through engagement in the empathy circle, but also getting them, I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you had also worked with students in, in the mainstream uh, schools and you're just explaining how, how you went about that. About your experience? Yeah. yeah. So first of all, we we did the mainstream experiential learning of what it's like to be a um, a listener and a speaker. But I also got them to reflect on during the empathy circle of their their reflections on how that was different for them. And each one of the students said, "I realised how hard it is to shut up." <laughs> I realized how I don't listen. I realized I I can 
I don't have to be rushed to say or know what I want to say, and nobody's judging me. So you, you were doing the empathy circles with the students, but you also had them reflect on what is their experience? How is their experience in the empathy circle different, maybe from everyday sort of dialogues? And they're saying, oh, you know, I don't feel judged. I don't feel I have time to speak. So there's just a lot of different uh, qualities that they were able to name and articulate. Mm. Um, the other thing is that uh, just on another tangent of the empathy circle is that you get the opportunity for five minutes to head the discussion in the direction you want rather than being constricted by a dominant character who changes the direction. Mm. And I'm one of those dominant characters that changes the direction for other people. So in a group, there can be a dominant person who kind of directs where the conversation is going to go. And you're one of those dominant kind of people. Let's go in my direction. Uh, but in the empathy circle, whoever is the speaker, they've got uh, their five minutes to take the whole group in the direction that they want to go in. That's, that's a, uh, another insight. And that was the uh, time. And thank you. I, I feel fully listened to, Edwin. <laughs> and I will now take the conversation in my direction, speaking to Wayne. <laughs> no, no, Leanne, Leanne, that's right. You already went twice. So, Leanne, can I speak to you then? Absolutely. Okay. Um, <coughs> yeah, so the, the, the uh, I'm working now on a right, I've had this model of empathy that I've sort of been using, but I'm really working now at kind of getting it written down and to create a training course about it. So this whole topic of defining empathy is sort of my central project now. So defining empathy and creating a uh, creating a model that can be easily communicated in, an, in a training course is your focus at the moment. And uh, the model I'm seeing, it's like empathy, a way of being model that it's, uh, and it's based on Rogers. He has this uh, paper, Carl Rogers, called Empathic and Unappreciated Way of Being. So it's empathy is this way of being, is, uh, is a way of sort of being this, you know? So that's the, the core starting point. Yeah. So based on the work of Rogers and you're looking to create a definition and a course around empathy that redefines it as a way of being it, how it is. Yeah. And it has many facets to it. So, you know, be, a way of being is, is there's a lot of different facets. So we can sort of explain different facets within, within that way, way of being. Uh, yeah. So, so even though it's a single definition, it would still have it would still be multifaceted and nuanced and because we're dealing with humans all yeah time. there's there, you can kind of keep exploring kind of infinitum you know describing kind of a phenomenon so it's it, you can just create different facets and some of the different facets are uh uh em em empathizing with others like right now you're sensing into me that's like the one facet uh empathizing with others. Um, so one of the facets is that external empathy, so empathizing with other people. And then another factor is self-empathy. So yes. I am sensing into my own self. And in fact, you listening to me is creating space so that I can sense into uh, kind of freely more, have more space to sense into what's going on in me which is self-empathy. So your empathy is actually supporting me in my self-empathy. So the other aspect that of the definition of empathy as a way of being is not only empathy for others, but empathy for yourself. And what you're telling me the empathy circle is giving you is a way of um, you understanding and almost reinforcing how you're feeling and giving you the space to understand how you're feeling while being heard by somebody else. Is exactly. that right? Exactly, yeah. And then another aspect is I would call imaginative empathy. So that is we can take on a role, like we could say the three of us here 
uh, you're, a, you're a koala, uh, Wayne is a kiwi, and I'm a, a grizzly. Now we're going to take on those roles and we're going to dialogue from those roles. So we're imagining ourselves in another role of something else, of an animal. And how do those animals dialogue with each other? Yeah, right. So another aspect is that imaginative empathy where you put yourself in the perspective of another person or another being, whether it's a koala or a kiwi or a grizzly, in order <laughs> to then speak from that perspective and imagine what that perspective and what that is like. Is that right? Exactly, 100%. And you, 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 we can also do other roles, like you could be Margaret Thatcher, I could be Donald Trump, and Wayne sure. could be, uh, you know, I don't know, Boris Johnson or something. So oh, we, could no. take, we could take on those roles too, or I could be you, you could be me and Wayne, or, you know, we could switch roles. So we can sort of imagine ourselves in any number of, of different roles. And that's what I'm calling imaginative empathy. It's kind of like what actors do. That's like another level of, uh, of empathy another facet yeah so the other facet that imaginative empathy um is not about what you're feeling necessarily it's not about what they're feeling in what you're perceiving but then going into the imaginary of what might somebody not actually what are they but what might somebody think or feel or say or see or do yeah exactly yeah and uh we can even imagine ourselves in the future too. So that's all, that's an imaginary, we're not there, it, we're, it's not in the moment, but I can imagine it and I can share it to you. So, you know, it becomes sort of a multi-dimensional, uh, the imagination. So I would, and this is sometimes kind of covered in the cognitive empathy, but isn't imaginative empathy so much sexier than cog the word cognitive empathy? <laughs> it, it's so much richer and fuller than, you know, cognitive empathy. Yeah. And, and so, so what you're saying, <laughs> cause I want to keep doing, um, what you're saying is using language to make this aspect of empathy more appealing and more, uh, almost less scary. So, and I think it's actually confident. more accurate. It's also mm -hmm. more accurate in terms of hitting the mark about what we're talking about. Yeah. So re reimagining almost mm -hmm. what cognitive empathy is is more imaginative empathy than um, dry taking someone else's perspective. Exactly, I feel fully heard. Yep. Oh, was that you're me? up again? So yep. Oh, sorry. Select whoever of us you want to speak to. Um. I'll go for, let's go Edwin again. <coughs> Listening. So when it comes to, oh, let me see what we're doing here. I do an, a version of this without the structure. So in my workshops, I don't just talk at people. We do lots of different activities and uh, experiences and ways of of playing with empathy. I'll go there. Yeah, so you're within your workshops, you're doing a lot of playing with empathy. It sounds like you have a lot of different activities to illustrate it, to experience yeah. it. Yeah, because I completely agree that you can't tell someone to be empathetic. This is not, you need to be empathetic because people go, oh, I don't know what that means. So using this empathy circle as a, and it, I guess another experiential tool that lets people, um, it, yeah, as another activity that lets people communicate and experience empathy in a different way. Mm -hmm. So you're saying this is a, a tool, the empathy circle to experience empathy versus just exhortation, telling people to be empathic. Oh, absolutely. Because that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, so it's, I like what you're saying about redefining empathy um, and the way that I sort of talk about the three different types. It feels like that's 
because I don't do it in a really dry way. We do it in a really rich sort of, okay, let's think about this and let's play with this. And how does that make you feel? And so it feels like we're solidly in what I call that compassionate empathy space. So the ability to share and understand the thoughts and feelings of another person and respond appropriately. And sometimes responding appropriately is saying nothing and responding appropriately is always couched in self-care. Mm -hmm. So you have a, kind of like a very rich activities that you do with uh, empathy activities, and it leads to uh, sort of a compassionate uh, empathy or compassionate approach that really has uh, looking at the responses, constructive re responses uh, for people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because like you said, it's not this all of the responsibility is on me as a listener to just take, 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 and there's zero responsibility on the speaker because that's one of the things that I've seen is people go, well, what's to stop people just venting on me? What's to stop me just becoming a doormat if I just have to listen and validate everybody? And you say, no, there's a responsibility on the speaker to also be empathetic. Mm -hmm. This so is a two-way street. Yeah, you're really seeing empathy as a two-way street because people who are just being empathic, just listening, listening, they just become feel like they're a doormat and you're advocating or showing how to do mutual uh, empathy, two-way. Abs mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, so it's it's giving, I guess, a structure to a different kind of activity that really reinforces that responsibility on the speaker to also be empathetic and that this isn't it yeah reinforces that empathy is not give 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 until you've burnt out mm -hmm. this is it's richer than that it's deeper than that and it's more community and collective than that yeah you're seeing empathy as a community collective aspect it's not just one person doing all the giving but there's a a mutuality of it and that's a that's an important part uh, I think you're saying it's an important part of it yeah and it's nice that it's it's there's always an insecurity when you talk to other people about empathy there's always an insecurity well when you talk to other people who know what this is what they do there's always an insecurity that you're doing it wrong or you're doing it could be better but this framework goes okay it reinforces what I'm already doing and can potentially add another layer to it in the right circumstances yeah so you're really seeing like for example the empathy circle could really reinforce and contribute to the existing processes that you're you're already uh, doing mm. I think there was a little bit of a concern like when you're with people who really know what they're doing and stuff there's a little anxiety about hey am I going to be judged or maybe, you know, criticized or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. There's always that fear of going, but maybe they, maybe I know more than like, or they know more than I do. And you're like, but I know it from my perspective. I know it with my story. I know it with my, uh, with my passion. And that even if we have slightly different ideas, we can discuss them because I'm bringing my experience and my story with it and that makes what I know valid and I know that's a tangent but that's where my mind went <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah you're just following where your mind went it seemed like a little, maybe a little embarrassed hey this maybe this is a tangent but that's where your mind went and it's uh that you have something that you're bringing to it and this is your point of view and it's something you can contribute maybe you have deeper understanding or less than other people but it's uh, it sounds like it's part of the the sharing and yeah. I don't know if I got that I think that was the time yeah. too do you feel okay. right about that or? yeah absolutely absolutely okay. uh speak to Wayne then um yeah that I think that's the thing with the empathy circle it, I think it creates a space where everybody can bring their ideas you don't have to worry about initially you don't have to worry about being criticized right you're going to get heard whatever you have to bring is going to get heard to your satisfaction uh, initially so what i heard you say edwin is that uh that's the the um the beauty i suppose of empathy circles is that no matter what you're going to be heard 
you don't have to worry about being criticized or whatever. You're going to have your opportunity no matter what. Yeah, you've got that space. But then when the other person gets to speak, they can criticize, they can do whatever they want. They're totally free to be judgmental, to, to be loving, to be whoever they are. So it, it creates a space so that they, so the person, the speaker can speak freely. So it, it creates the space, the space where you can say whatever you want. So if the next person wants to criticize you or, or whatever, they can because that's their space mm -hmm. so they can feel like hey i'm not going to be suppressed whatever frustrations or whatever i have are not going to be suppressed i can let them out whatever feelings yeah. i have i can let them out yeah yeah so, so as the speaker you can feel as though that whatever feelings you have you can just let them out and, and not be suppressed and they will be met by this empathic space right for there's this in so whatever they say, it can be judgmental, which is kind of a block to empathy, but that judgment will be met with empathy, which actually is very transformative. It almost like it kind of transforms judgments. People are usually judging people because they're not feeling heard. When they start feeling heard, kind of their judgments tends to, over time, fall away. Mm. So what I heard you say there is that no matter what you say, it's going to be met with an empathic space. Um, and even though it might be criticized later, it's still heard, you're still developing that, uh, that space, that opportunity to feel that empathy. Yeah, and, and the empathy circle is a great practice for conflict mediation. So bring in people who are really at each other's throats, deep hurts, deep pains, and it, it's a bit of a shit show, to, you know, but given enough time, it starts kind of working itself out and people start having mutual understanding and it becomes a space to kind of work out those conflicts and start seeing each other's humanity, give it enough time and space, you know, two, three, four, five hours. Eventually, I find, you know, these conflicts, deep conflicts, you know, family conflicts, etc., can start being addressed. So you, you see the empathy circles as an ideal way to deal with conflict um, because even though the, the people may come in with deep anger and, and frustration and everything, they're given that space and, and over time that space is filled with, with a more, more humanity. Yeah, that's been, at least that's been my experience. Uh, so... The other thing is, is I know there's this model affect of cognitive compassion. I'm not a fan of the compassion uh, aspect of it because the compassion community says, oh, compassion, we do action. Empathy doesn't do action. That's not maybe what Leanne's, she's shaking her head. But I, I do know compassion activists who are kind of making that, that case, yeah. So the, the other reason why you're not happy with the current model, which is sort of affective, cognitive and, and uh, compassionate, is because of the, um, the, the, the issue of compassionate empathy and that, that debate there that, that empathy does not have action. Mm -hmm. I see that empathy is very action-oriented. I think uh, Leanne mentioned human-centered design. Uh, you know, empathy is central to creative ideas, generating ideas and implementing that. And uh, so it, you don't need compassion for that. It's like, let's just have fun creating ideas and generating new ways of improving our, our, our well-being. So you mm. don't need compassion to take action. So I disagree with all those compassion community folks who are kind of out, you know, saying that oh, empathy is bad because... Uh, you got to have compassion because only that takes action, does action. Yes. So you, you disagree with the uh, the compassion element there because the empathy creates that space, that that time in which that deeper understanding can can be facilitated, and the creative ideas be generated. Yeah. And actually, you can create a lot of creativity, innovation. I mean. It comes out of human-centered design, which is found foundational is, is empathy to that process. 
So in addition to that is that it, it, it can develop the creative aspect, creational um, design and things like that. A lot of things can be created within the empathy circle, that the empathic environment. And, and the compassion is by definition, it's a geared towards suffering, right? And if, I don't know, if it, are any of you suffering here? I don't know. If, if there's no suffering here, then we don't need compassion, right? So mm. it's like, but we have empathy because that's increasing our sense of connection, heightening our sense of enjoyment, you know? So that's, it's almost like the suffering part and saying all of life is suffering. I don't agree with that. Maybe it's part of life, but it's not all of life. Yeah, so the, the point you made uh, there was that uh, you didn't see in the environment we've got here is the, there's no suffering or they didn't that you don't think there's suffering. So so does empathy need to exist? Uh, without no, that? does compassion need to exist? Because yeah. compassion oh, is by definition yeah, towards yeah. compassion. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that compassion doesn't the, the aspect of compassion is not a big part of or not essential to the empathy part the empathy part is just opening that space i feel very heard thank you i yeah um leanne oh me again okay i, I want to bring up a couple of things and that is communication if we're talking about communication one may say that over time as a society, as our communication has become more sophisticated. However, it hasn't. It's become less sophisticated because all we've been doing is been putting in more words. And one of the aspects that we're starting to talk about or starting to sense in this empathy circle is we're picking up aspects of communication that haven't got words attached to them. Feelings. I can sense a feeling of excitement. I can, I can sense, Leanne, with you, the, the thinking that's going on. The, the, the. I'll, I'll stop it there. Okay. So what I'm hearing is the. When we look at communication, especially modern communication, a lot of people say that it's getting more sophisticated, but your your statement or your opinion is that we're getting more quantity without getting more quality and it's looking more at the quality of the communication in in its richness in terms of words but only your non also your non-verbals and your facial expressions and your emotions is that right yes and to get the deeper levels of understanding the empathic understanding and what i call the the empathic communication, as Edwin said, you need to give the space for it to occur. Yeah. And the trouble is in most of our conversations, we're just filling everything with words. So, yeah, in order for in order for empathetic communication to occur, there needs to be that space. There needs to be the pause. There needs to be the gap before a response. But modern communication is we're just filling all the gaps. We're just putting words in without truly understanding what the other person's verbals and nonverbals are saying. And we're just filling the gaps. Is that right? Yes. So when Edwin was talking about um, that empathy circles um, and empathic communication allows for creativity, it also allows a greater opportunity for, um, if I was to get three physicists together and to get them to discuss string theory using an empathic circle, I'm sure there would be greater depth of discussion than if there was just them sitting around a coffee table talking to each other. So using so using the empathy circle as a as a creative process no matter what the topic is gives people not only the opportunity to um 
think about what they're saying to interpret what the other person is saying but it gives them the space to be more creative because there is that space there is that space to reflect before you speak or before you respond and that can lead to greater creativity no matter what the topic is is that right yeah yeah so in experiencing an empathy circle I believe you go through stages. The mm -hmm. first stage is realizing at, at a very fundamental level, I don't listen. I talk too much. Um, I want a button. All those basic aspects of that um, restrict the development of empath empathic communication. Um, so <laughs> the things that restrict empathic communication is thinking about what we're going to say or what we're going to say next or what we want to say, but the empathy circle, at least the beginning stages of an empathy circle, because um, you're going to tell me hopefully about the other stages, but the beginning is the realization that we don't listen to reflect we listen to respond or we listen to reply yeah think about so what we're first, yeah so so i would say the beginning stages are the mechanics yeah the second stage is a deeper level of understanding and reflection on the potentials of of when you're the non-responder or the not the responder or the you're the passive listener you're able to reflect at a deeper level because over time you stop wanting well you stop trying to respond and you reflect at a deeper level at the conversation of the other two yeah as the speaker you start to stop and have pauses and think about what you're going to say rather than just saying off the top of your head. So that yeah. second stage is a deeper level of communicate empathic communication. Yeah. So the first step is the mechanics. The first step is, huh, I'm not as good a listener as I thought because I'm just thinking about what I want to say next. Once you move past that into the second stage, you go, right, now I'm actually paying attention. Then you get into that level of, mindfulness or okay mindfulness of not only what are the other two people saying and reflecting um but also what is it that's going on and how do i participate fully in that is that right thank you i feel fully listened to thanks leanne that's all good all right so 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 so, so where am i going to go with this um who are you speaking to? Oh, la, 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 la. <laughs> I'm going to go. Who did I speak to last time? I think I spoke to Wayne last time. No, Edwin last time. I'll go Wayne. Hi, Wayne. So if we think about the stages, because my reflection on, on this circle and how we, I guess, use it to make an empathy movement, because in order to have an empathy movement, people have to be vulnerable. I'll start there. Okay, so if we now think about those stages and start to think about creating movement, um, I've lost the rest of it, sorry. That's all right. That's all right. I'm now sort of trying to put together if we're going to, or if I, because I other people are obviously doing it, if I'm going to somehow use an empathy circle to create a move a movement of empathy or an empathy movement as we described before i'm going to riff for the next 5 minutes on how that sits with me and how i might i guess consolidate that in my brain yeah so now it's the the time if we're going to um create this movement then what's going to happen now is that you sort of riff this and and, and see how it might manifest in in what yeah. you're doing moving forward yes 
Because from, and I like that you're talking about stages because the words that I wrote down were safe vulnerability. And because this is an act of vulnerability, speaking, listening, getting it wrong, um, having somebody disagree with you, talking about feelings. But at the beginning of this session, anyway, it felt like we were just paraphrasing, like you said, that those mechanics pieces. And as we've gone along, it feels like now we're talking a bit more emotional. Now we're starting to get to the the interesting stuff. So it's it's looking at the evolution of an empathy circle within an empathy circle. Mm. So what is coming through as an aha for you is that initially we were really learning and, and, and experiencing the mechanics, the sort of just paraphrasing and stuff like mm -hmm. that. As we've developed um, the empathy, empathic communication within this very empathy circle, we've become more uh, a deeper level of communication. Yeah, I, th I think so. And I think if we're looking at a movement of empathy, it's, it's being okay with that initial awkwardness. It's making people okay, because everybody, unless you've been doing this for a very long time, I'm guessing, but even with a new group, you would feel uncomfortable and awkward and unsure at the beginning but the natural evolution of the circle is then that that's okay. There's a there's an empathy and an understanding that it's meant, this isn't natural, this isn't normal, this isn't how we're supposed to communicate, but that's okay. Mm. So in the evolution, if you're looking at, uh, at this movement, is that there's, a, there's got to be an understanding that there's going to be an awkwardness right at the very beginning because it's new to people. and But it, it's okay to understand that this will develop over time. It's part of the process. Yeah, because I, I feel like with a movement of empathy, if, we don't, if we're not even starting to have these conversations, which is what we're all trying to do, but if we're trying to use an empathy circle as part of a movement, it would be, I feel like there would be that hesitancy of people to go, oh, it's it's a love in or we're just going to sing Kumbaya or we're all going to, it's a big group hug. And getting, I guess, leaning into that uncomfortability and going, it's meant to be awkward to start with. That's okay. Like you're allowed to feel however it is that you feel, but lean into the process, trust the process. And it's an, and I, like I said, I wrote down safe vulnerability. We're not taking you places you don't want to go. We're not asking you to tell us your deepest, darkest secrets unless you want to, but it's safe vulnerability and it's going to be awkward and once people learn that that's okay, they don't have to have the right answer. They don't have to be perfect. You're allowed to feel uncomfortable. That's when I think you, this will become more of a movement when we let people be awkward. Yeah. So what I what I heard you saying there is that this is this is part of the process, but it's trusting the process encouraging people the movement will start when when people are encouraged to lean into the, the empathy circle and and trust that vulnerability because that is part of the process yeah thank you i think that's right okay um edward mm -hmm. um, i'm going to start heading into the movement itself now um, because we could we could continue sort of deepening our our understanding, Leanne, um, of the role of the empathy circle within the movement itself. But I'd like to start talking about the mechanics of rolling out the the movement. Mm -hmm. So you'd really like to 
transition to talking about the mechanics of rolling out a, a movement versus just sort of exploring the nature of the empathy circle, for, for example, more of an action oriented strategy, strategizing maybe. Yeah. And the reason for that is we, we, we have all the elements. Um, Edwin, your depth of, of knowledge and, and understanding, and there's enough people out there doing the empathy circles and experiencing them to know that they're good. Um, I, I'm happy from my perspective that from a theoretical perspective, it's probably the best example that I've ever seen of actually developing em empathic communication rather than just talking about it. Mm -hmm. So the empathy circle is the best way of develop that you've seen of developing empathic communication versus just talking uh, about it. And there's a depth of knowledge and understanding that, and people who have sort of done this already to be, I guess, as a building block. Okay, so therefore, just one second, I've got, um... Sorry, I'm just in a um, session at the moment, uh, Zoom. Okay, talk to you later. As you see, technology interrupts. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, empathy. Um, a bit of interruption for you acknowledging yeah. the interruption. Uh -huh. So um, I think the next step for um, creating the movement is I think we've got to, and I, I think the empathy movement needs to commercialize the beginning or, or the initial rollout. And the, and the way I see this occurring is to allowing people to, um, to use the empathy circles within their, their, consultancy work but then as part of that tell people that this is open source and free so that they're not selling the empathy circle but by being allowed to use the empathy circle as part of their uh, consultancy um, you're going to have a workforce promoting empathy circles so it's a little bit like going to a conference and telling people that they can use google maps is i i might be selling myself as a uh digital teacher so i'm selling myself services as a, dig, as a digital teacher but i'm telling them about all the free stuff and the great stuff that's out there Mm, so you're seeing a, a way to sort of spread the word, the move, build the movement is to uh, sort of a commercialized component to it, where people who are consultants, that they, this is an open source, the empathy circle is open source, encourage them to use it. And through the using of it, they will spread it through their uh, commercial practices. And that's a strategy for sort of spreading the, the practice. Yeah. And, and within that, I think there needs to be the support of um, the work that you do, Edwin, and the organization of empathy circles. So perhaps if, and, and I'm going to use you as an example, Leanne, in, within your work, if you bring in empathy circles as a one of the tools that you use, then you, you pay through to um, uh, global empathy or whatever organizational structure is at the top end, a certain fee um, that will enable you, Edwin, to keep the, 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 the top end going, but also enables you, Leanne, to um, promote empathy circles without plagiarizing. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at how to sort of spread the empathy circles as sort of part of the empathy movement, and you're seeing that the sort of a commercialization process can, can be used where people can use the empathy circle, they get support from the empathy center, 
and but that they also contribute to keeping that center uh, going as well. So there's a financial dynamic that commercial dynamic that can go. Yeah. So the cool thing here is that within this empathy circle, I feel I feel uh, not trusted. I I feel secure and non-threatened because Edwin may totally disagree with me. And Leanne, you may have an issue with what I've said, but I've had this five minutes to myself. I've had this space to share my vision and you get to critique my vision when it's your turn. Yeah, so you're just saying that with the empathy circle, like you just really like this feeling that you've been able to share your vision of the ideas that you have. Maybe nobody agrees with you, or maybe they do, but you've had your space to at least clearly articulate the vision. And it sounds like you really enjoy that, that you really feel, feel safe to you and feels good. And oh, and that was the time too, that was six okay. minutes. Okay. Thank you, I feel fully heard, Edwin. Okay. Uh, Leanne, can I speak to you? Yep, go for it. Uh, yeah, the the commercial aspect is the, the empathy circle is sort of open source as well as the uh, training. We've tried to make it uh, sort of a, something that's out there public. The trainings are all recorded. So, and we're trying to spread spread that practice. And it's kind of how to set up the financial aspect has always been a challenge. So I'm, I'm glad to hear Wayne's ideas about how to make it commercially or financially, you know, feasible. So the financial feasibility is not something that you've looked at yet, but you are open to it because at the moment the the all the resources and is it the facilitator training that's open source as well. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. the circles and the training, five week training is is an open source. And they're they're free. Uh, they, they, it's by donation. The uh, the uh, training is donation. You know, people donate to varying degrees. Yeah. Then, can I ask? Am I allowed no, to ask? Just just no, reflect. <laughs> so I'm sorry. So you're just um, so yeah, at the moment, all the training and everything, it's five weeks and it's free, but it's on donation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, how to, I do see that. So I see practices like nonviolent communication. I think one reason that that is really spread is because they have like trainings and everybody thinks that I'm going to be a trainer. And then they kind of go and train and by what they're out connecting with their community and friends. So that commercialization using the commercial mechanisms to spread it, I see that that does have a a, a spreading does spread uh, a practice or a process. Yeah. Yeah. So adding that uh, legitimacy and commercialization around the empathy circle trainer, uh, similar to what NBC is doing, has potential uh, that may be able to ex be explored. Is that right? Yeah, I see how it's worked with NBC, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. There's a lot of trainers out there, you know, training that and they set up their own workshops and doing that, they they sort of spread the message. Uh, yeah, so NBC have their own program, they have their own trainers, they have their own uh, certified training courses mm -hmm. and you can potentially see alignment with empathy circles training and getting the message out there through a series of almost certified trainers is that right yeah yeah or even people who aren't certified but they're just uh they're applying using it in their whatever their practices are right i think that's what there's all kinds of different workshops and trainings i think wayne is mean that they can use the empathy circle practice and tools within their whatever structures they're they're doing yeah so allowing consultants and practitioners to use the empathy training empathy train uh, empathy circle skills and training and adapt them to what it is that they're doing uh, the other part i'm seeing is let's get uh activists like yourselves like you know i see you post and stuff online let's get us together to have these dialogues because 
I see and I spread it. So hopefully, you know, you can each kind of reach out to other activists and let's hold these ongoing diet empathic circle dialogues as sort of an engine to get the community together and get them get people connected because there's not like a whole lot of connection between different uh, empathy activists. So looking at the value of creating a community of empathy activists, but using the structure of the empathy circle to get the empathy activists together to practice what we preach. preach. That's a good term for it. Yeah, practice what we're preaching. And the creativity and innovation sort of comes out of the dialogue, right? It's like you, you, something maybe in this conversation will kind of spark something, which gives me energy to kind of take it out into the world. So I do see sort of dialogues uh, as a, a foundational, uh, it's doing it, but it's also it has this positive aspect for new ideas get sort of birthed in uh, through dialogue. Yeah. So by creating a community of empathy activists and practicing open dialogue and practicing empathy circles in order to create the, the social connection and creativity and innovation that we're trying to create on our own, we do it in an empathy circle in a socially connected group of empathy activists. So using the tools to create the space that we want to create, but doing it in a connected way instead of an isolated mm -hmm. way. Yeah, and we've developed friends. I really like you, Lee. <laughs> and and Wayne, even though he doesn't respond to emails very much, it's like there's a sense of connection. You know, it's like, hey, we're you know we're in this together, and I really enjoy the the connection and, and talking to. You. And I've seen your posts, for example, but being in a dialogue with you, hearing who you really are, I, I think is great. Yeah. So. <laughs> putting a face to the name, actually showing the value of humanity, showing the in the individual value of humanity and creating those relationships within people who are, I'm going to say kindred spirits, has value in moving forward the empathy movement. Yeah, and it's meaningful. It's, there's, a, there's a meaningful quality for, for me, at least. Yeah. Mm. If you just reflect that last part, I'll feel heard. Oh, sorry. And and yeah, creating those relationships creates meaning within the work that you are doing and with the the empathy movement overall. I feel fully heard, and that's my time. Oh, me? No, me? Yes, me again. Ah, uh, la 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 la. So thinking a bit. Oh, sorry. Okay, hi Wayne. Um, who am I going to choose? Let's go, I think Edwin this time. Okay, listening. Sorry, I'm learning. I'm learning. Okay, you're apologizing, but you didn't select who to speak to, <laughs> and so you just let everyone know you're learning the process. So, all right. In terms of how, in terms of how this works. Um, the I like the idea of uh, a validation around this. I like the idea of a certification around this. I like the idea of a structure and a credibility, I think is the word that I'm looking for, around an empathy circle to, especially in Australia, because we have a culture of who, we, who are you and who are you to be talking to me about this? So there's that skeptic culture that we have here. Mm, so Australia is a sort of a skeptic culture. And you find that if there's like a certification titles structure around that people take it more seriously. So you would like to see that uh, aspect. So because you'd like uh, the Australians to accept, have be more accepting of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. And that, that tends to be we're very much well what are your qualifications and who are you and who are you to be talking to me about this so being able to add that facilitator so a certified facilitator um, works quite well we've got mental health first aid you've got Brene Brown's dare to lead um, NVC is not as huge over here but it exists so being able to 
have that support and have that credibility when trying to run these um, or incorporate it into a consultancy would have value in this country. Mm -hmm. So in Australia, having those certifications would, would add value uh, acceptance uh, for the practice. Yeah, I believe, I believe so. Um, and then, yeah, and then looking at, looking at how that then becomes part of the common conversation. How do you increase awareness of an empathy circle in a way that is not mocked? So to me, that would then be uh, having empathy circles, not asking the general public, but showing them exactly how you're doing here of showing people modeling it, showing the value of it, showing people, um, I mean, our politicians, it's, it's like toddler time. So we do not see examples in our leadership of empathic listening. It is not something that is modeled. It is not something people look up to. It is something that is ridiculed. So using an empathy circle as a model of communication, as opposed to asking people to join it to start with. Mm -hmm. So you see uh, a way to promote the empathy circle, empathy movement is for people to see uh, empathy sort of modeled and you're identifying politicians who kind of they're very unempathic and uh maybe if they were to do empathy circles that would be a model they could model it and people would learn through the modeling yeah potentially and getting it part of the language getting it part of the like the common language that we use of empathetic communication healthy empathy and actually watching what it looks like now I don't know what that looks like in this country, but people who are open to it have a huge opportunity, I think, to, to show that there's another way of communicating. Mm -hmm. So having an empathy circle with these high profile politicians would be, and people would observe it and they would see that there's other ways of communicating and, 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 you're kind of looking at how to get it out there, how to get people aware of it. And it would be this modeling. You're looking for places to model it. Yeah. And again, it's that breaking down the skepticism, breaking down the fear and breaking down the, oh, this is a, this is a, a big group hug. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm actively against group, like empathy train being a big group hug. Like that's not what this is. This isn't. Um like high fives but it's it's breaking down and like I said right at the beginning empathy is feared and mocked in this country mm -hmm. so changing what people see um, and changing that language and that's what I'm trying to do but using this as another tool to actually model and demonstrate that there's another way of communicating. So you'd really like to show that there's another way of communicating that is typically done in, in Australia. And you're sort of looking at how to how to model it and, and demonstrate it. And these people are very critical of empathy and that you might, you're looking for ways of getting past that criticism. Mm. Yeah, and absolutely. That was absolutely. the time too. Oh, oh sorry. So. Okay, uh, Wayne, what is Um, yeah, I, I've been trying to uh, do that with, that's why I ran for Congress was as the empathy candidate. So it was like, how do I get empathy into the, into that public sphere? You know, that the news covers, the politicians covers, how to inject it into uh, sort of an awareness into that. And I thought, well, let's run for Congress and, you know, maybe that'll be a way. You're muted. You've been interested in, uh, or what I heard you say, when is that you've been interested in in how to promote that out there and get it out into the into the wider sector. And and you ran for Congress as a 
as a possible way to to get that out there um, into the wider media and and get that movement going. And the first thing I did is I reached out to the other candidates and said, hey, let's do an empathy circle. And I did one with myself and there was five candidates and two of them were willing to take part. And one who was a Republican, I was running as a Democrat. Uh, he wanted to take part, but couldn't. So it would have been. So anyway, the three of us did it with facilitator. We did an empathy circle. So as part of that, you uh, you reached out to the other uh candidates and uh you were a democrat standing as a democrat and and there was a republican and you actually uh enabled that to happen with a facilitator yeah he the republican didn't the timing didn't work so but he was willing to and the establishment candidate the person who's already in congress he didn't even answer it was like i'm not even bothering to talk to you guys you know it's like multiple invites. He just totally blew it off. Yeah, so the uh, the Republican would have liked to have been there, so was keen to do that. Um, and the uh, the the person that's actually in Congress um, just blew the whole thing off and, mm -hmm. and wasn't interested after multiple invitations. And somebody else in, in our group, you know, from San Francisco, he saw it. He thought, hey, that's great. And he did one in Nancy Pelosi's district. She's running for Congress again. She did. She was the same thing. She blew it off. But two of the candidates in that district did do an empathy circle with. Yeah. yeah so in another district where Nancy Pelosi's uh, standing, um, he managed to do an empathy circle, but Nancy Pelosi blew it off as well. And. What has really worked in terms of getting publicity, I mean, I didn't get a lot of publicity. I mean, it was the media didn't even really cover what I was, the message I was trying to get out. It's like, oh, the establishment candidate, he's going to win and forget everybody else. So I mean, that was pretty much the, 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 the message. Um, but where we have gotten a lot of publicity has been with our empathy tent. So we took, it's a physical tent that we took out on, into the streets offering listening to people and also going to kind of these conflict places where like in Berkeley, the it's a very liberal place and the political right would come to demonstrate for free speech. And then Antifa, the anti-fascists and the leftists would come and they'd have knock down, drag out fights. And we'd have the empathy tent, you know, kind of offering listening to both sides. And that's what we where we got the most uh, media attention was out in the public on the street uh yeah so we with the, the the political uh sort of thing you really didn't get much uh, uh media from that and where you have really got the media um interest is the empathy tent um and through going to university which is a very liberal uh thing you've got different warring factions um to actually engage in the empathy uh empathy circle environment and and yeah, that's where you've got yeah. yeah, exactly. And it was in Berkeley, not just the university, but the city of Berkeley and Sacramento and Los Angeles. So uh, we did take it out to different cities. And and, and that was, uh, you know, it was like New York, not New York, the Los Angeles Times, Sacramento Bee, you know, different TV stations, even Fox, you know, mentioned it on their show, kind of a national show. They mentioned the empathy tent. Breitbart, yeah. who was instrumental in getting Trump elected, they mentioned it. Yeah, so uh, the, you've taken it to different cities like Berkeley and and uh, San Francisco and and the even national uh, media organisations like Fox have have, have mentioned the uh, the empathy tent and what you've been doing there. Yeah, so I've seen that that being on the streets, sort of like Black Lives Matter, they got their publicity being out on the streets. So there's something about sort of a street level actions that is what the media pays attention to. Uh, you know, they didn't pay attention to my congressional campaign, but I, that, so I'm thinking that that is another strategy is take it to the streets. Yeah, so so a big aspect uh, that you think is successful is taking it to the streets level. So Black Lives Matter did things on the streets and they got lots of publicity from it. And, and perhaps if we're looking at a movement, that's another channel of, of, uh, of wider publicity. And I think that what's needed beforehand is that some training 
curriculum set up. So we've got the empathy circle, we have the facilitator training. Now I want to define empathy, uh, the, tr the uh, definition, you know, six week course. And then one more course, uh, uh, maybe kind of going deeper. So they have a, if we do some kind of a street level action, like an Occupy Empathy, that, you know, we camp out, that we've got a whole training that we do out on the streets. So I see that, yeah. Mm. So you see different layers of this, uh, in a sense of the the um, the definition of empathy, and then uh, the another training level where you sort of camp out and and uh, provide that sort of a, a rollout. Mm -hmm. I feel fully heard. Got a lot more to say, but that's my time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Leanne. Um, I, I think the first thing is. Whenever I'm doing these empathy circles, there's there's elements that I want to, some aha moments that I, I want to share. Um, and the first one is that often when you're in a discussion, something comes into your mind and you put it into the discussion. Within the empathy circle environment here is that a number of those things that you want to say, you can't say, and after a period of time, you've actually developed on from there. And you don't want to say that anymore. And you've got something more insightful to say. Yeah. So with the empathy circle, be because you're not allowed to say the first thing that comes into your mind, you marinate on it and then um, it becomes either not as important or it becomes more fully developed before it's your opportunity to speak again. Is that right? Yes. Yep. Um, the, the, the second thing is that um, now I've got to stop for a second because I've got to think what I'm going to talk about. Um, ah, now that one's gone. Okay. The other thing is that you don't feel when you're saying something and you lose track of, of what you were talking about, there's less anxiety because this is my space. And if I don't want to say anything in my space, I don't have to. So there's a, there's a, a, a comfort in not having to say anything, not having to do anything, because there is no right and wrong. So there's a comfort in losing your train of thought, completely changing track, because this is your space and it is yours to do what you like with it. And there's a level of comfort and safety with that. That means you can take it wherever you like, because it's yours. Yeah. Um, and having that comfort and space, and I've just experienced this right now, is that after I'd finished and then you started to repeat back to me, it came to me um, what I was wanting to talk about. So that was valid, that, that's, this is validation of the, the process working. Um, so I'll stop at that point. So, in losing your train of thought and in talking about your train of thought and in having it uh, responded back to you, you thought of what that you thought of the train of thought that you lost, which shows that the process is working as a reflective, um, open practice of sharing ideas. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Um, now, the next thing I sort of want to talk about is that this taking the movement forward is that a big part of the learning with empathy circles should be, in fact, the main part of learning empathy circles should be in the empathy circle. So the way I see this working is that you, Leanne, might get three of your engaged customers and actually say, look, we're going to do an empathy circle. And this is where we're going to learn it. Because if you look at your experience, 
you've experienced the 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 basic fundamental skills um, aha moments through that process you've experienced the deeper understandings and potential of empathy circles and you're going to go away from this to our session being born again ready to preach so therefore um rather than uh focusing on perhaps how we can roll this out it's finding people who will do an empathy circle who have influenced beyond the circle so if i'm if i'm hearing you right it's less about learning to facilitate and more about experiencing the circle as a means of learning and understanding that the emotions that you feel in an empathy circle are just as valid as the instructions and getting people of influence in an empathy circle who could potentially then take that experiential learning out to a wider audience not as a facilitator but as an advocate is that right? Yeah, an advocate or even, an, and this is where I go into the next section, which is the different roles that people will have in the movement. Now, yeah. I'm, I'm never a person, which you probably realize this, Edwin, is I'm not a, a person that goes out and advocates and, and sells things, but I'm very much a deep research type thinker on the processes that go on and being within an empathy circle itself at a higher higher level of influence excites the hell out of me so if you were to get uh, a boss of a corporate or a boss of whatever i would relish the opportunity of being in an empathy circle because they would take that on and move it out um the other thing is i'll stop there so you get ex excited by the prospect of being within an empathy circle for people of influence who would be influenced not only of what you're saying potentially in an empathy circle but also of the experience of being in an empathy circle because it would be so far removed from their comfort zone that you can have influence in two ways and then they can talk about it with other people Is that right? yes absolutely now this is a frustration because of can i buy another minute edwin <laughs> <laughs> i'd like to buy a vowel please uh, it'll come around again. That's the, that's the, you got to sit with the frustration. <laughs> um, all right. I'm going to talk to, to Wayne. I don't know what about yet. So the idea of the, uh, the idea of having people of influence. So leaders of big corporates, people, muggles in my language, people who don't quite, they're not quite, they don't get it. They're quite individualist. So having a, an empathy circle of those people would be very interesting, like you said, from those two different perspectives, not only hearing, um, almost forcibly hearing a different perspective, but doing it in a way that is enlightening and uncomfortable so what what you're very interested in thinking about at the moment and, and trying to put together is that um having some of those muggles the ones that really don't get it and almost in a way forcing them to experience the empathy circle sounds very intriguing to you Mm, it does because the the conversations 
and it's not even conversations it because we're not necessarily giving the opportunity to converse it's the opportunity to listen to different perspectives my curiosity then is would they take that on board what would be their aha moment that brings them on board to go not only empathy is a thing that is worth their time but an empathy circle is a thing that is worth their time what is the the revelation that we would hope would would happen in that the course of that let's say two hours yeah so what really interests you is in bringing those people in what is the revelation of not just the um the learning about empathy circles but the experience of the empathy circles what revelations what aha moments would be there for them mm. and, and and the value of that for themselves and the organization mm. because i still feel like this is the how part i still feel like those the people who are skeptics the people who are muggles i feel like they would still need to have context of what empathy is and why it matters and then bring this in as the how piece here is a way to put it into practice um and to me that would then appeal to that more skeptical academic mind that learning why this matters to them personally and professionally and then here is a, a tool in order to develop and nourish that as mm. opposed to hoping that the empathy circle does it in and of itself yeah so you're still questioning whether there needs to be an element before that to justify and outline the purpose and the mm -hmm. and the benefit of an empathy circle and then the having them the opportunity to experience the empathy circle so it's that element before and the importance of that element before that you're uh, you're thinking mm -hmm. about yeah i feel like in order to get people into a room because again it's that what is it that brings them into the room in the first place and it's it can't be pure altruism they can't be coming for other people in this society in this individualist society we've got to kind of frame it as in what's in it for them for their business and it's almost sometimes it feels like selling out when you have to explain empathy and in muggle terms of dollars and productivity but and i'm just it might not be but just bringing that into a way that gives them context gives the reason to get them into the circle in the first place okay so i'm going to try and explain this from a deeper level yes not actually explain the words you used yes but what i think you were thinking about and that is what you were thinking i I think there is that we need to think deeply about what brings these people in that it's it, it, as far as you're concerned it's not the 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 greater good that's going to bring these people in it's the economic benefits or the the staffing benefits um so that's going to be and and you're worried that that might be a bit of a sellout to to the concept of empathy but it's something that may be required to get them engaged yeah absolutely and it's i guess it's thinking empathetically about what matters to the people we want in the room and not judging the fact that they think that the maserati is important that's cool that's that's your thing it's not important to me but not judging the people who are the muggles and looking at where they're at and looking at meeting them where they're at and what matters to them to then reframe what it is that we want them to learn and the benefits that we all know the benefits that we've seen the healthy happy staff and the all the the all those things but it's how do you meet someone where they're at so that there's you bridge that divide between this is what I think it is. This is why I don't want to do it. 
okay, well, how do I use your language to bring you into this, this movement, I guess? So just explaining that is a big part of this process is being empathic anyway, is mm. understanding what, it, what drives them and what motivates them and then using that as a, a, a way to bring them into what the reasons we know are beneficial to empathy. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Right. My turn. I'll choose you, Edward. Okay. Listening. Okay. So um, given the time, I think I'd, I'd like to start to sort of try and pull things together. Um, so in the process that we've been through, we've, we've gone through the layer of the, the basic mechanics and the experiential learning of the mechanics and a reminder to me of the, of the mechanics. We've gone through the second layer, which is uh, sort of the deeper understanding and, and thinking that goes on um, and creativity and, and opportunity. So that's, the, that's those two levels. And then the third level we've talk, talked about is rolling this out. How do we roll this out? Mm -hmm. So you're wanting to wrap this up. We're coming into the end of our two hours and you're kind of going through. We've done this first level of kind of getting, you know, with the empathy circle. We've kind of gone to a deeper level, kind of sensing deeper into it. Uh, and uh, now you're kind of wanting to see about what do we do to roll this out? What's the, so the next step, maybe sort of an action vision or action step. Yeah, and I think the next the next layer on this is is to engage people at the interest level and the interest roles that they see themselves in the movement. We all have different motivations. We all have different skills, and now's the opportunity to say, "Okay, where do you want to head with this?" Mm -hmm. um, and if I use myself as the start, is that I, I'm not interested in the the sales, the the consultancy selling the the um, the empathy circle. What I am interested in is adding to the credibility of the empathy circle movement um, through my doctoral work, um, adding to the opportunity for commercial people um, to be able to tap into that academic um, uh, credibility and also provide to you, Edwin, the opportunity to rather than at a sort of a more basic level um, involvement in empathy circles, especially if you're getting involved with, with people who are thinking about empathy circles from a, from a higher level philosophical sort of level, which we've delved slightly into. Mm -hmm. So kind of going forward, you're saying that each person has sort of their area of interest or expertise Yours is not like marketing and so forth. It's really about building on the credibility that you have as an academic, the certification, the PhD, and kind of going deeper into uh, maybe defining things, kind of building on, on that. And so that's kind of the area. And I think there's something about maybe circles with higher profile people or something like that was another. So those are sort of, you're you seeing, just sharing where, where you kind of see a direction yeah, and and whilst it um, when I said when I'm cautious of the word higher profile people, probably more with those people who get it. Um, we could do one with politicians, and we'd be talking to chickens without a head. Uh, that doesn't interest me. Mm. Whereas there might be a couple of other professors that have never done this before, oh. and then or it might be some politicians who get it. Mm -hmm. But it's taking those people from the basic, some people learn the basic skills and never get the, the potential of deeper empathic communication. 
Mm. I'm interested in the deeper empathic communication opportunities with the empathy circles. Okay, so you're really looking at how to have deeper uh, empathic understanding and communication uh, with people who maybe aren't familiar with the practice, but have that potential, at least. There's people who just wouldn't even have the potential or just no interest. <laughs> so you're really looking for, for and, and sort of a deeper exploration uh, of, the, of the quality, the philosophical, uh, maybe even existential yeah. nature of it or something. And if I pass over to Leanne now, I'm hoping Leanne wants to sell this opportunity to a lot of people um, and a lot of people hopefully in influential positions because this will roll out faster if this if you have the um, the CEO of this and the CEO of that and the CEO of the other rather than the people on the shop floor um, so in a way I want to be able to support that commercialization of saying, hey, look, Dr. Wayne Duncan's going to be part of the empathy circle and he's going to discuss why we're doing this. Now, I won't teach them. I'll just frame different aspects of where I think things are going. So I think you, Leanne, you're a, you're a, you're a um, I guess, a, a consultant commercial person that I'm hoping will go forth. And I want to encourage you all the way. So for every one of me, we need about 20 of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so That's you'd like me. to take part in empathy circles like with Leanne, if she's kind of connecting with community members, uh, you know, who, who are sort of like CEOs or, or et cetera, that you would like to take part in those circles to add sort of these deeper understandings and layers uh, to that, that's something you feel that you could contribute uh, to. Thank you. I feel okay. fully heard. And we only got five minutes left, so maybe we can just quickly. Uh, I'll say some next steps, and Leanne would just, without reflection, uh, and also, yeah, we'll just do that quickly. For me, I want to hold more of these empathy circles with activists. So, if you know of any activists, I've got a whole list of people. Uh, so if you'd like to take part with some, in some more of those, uh, if you want to reach out to any of those activists, you know, who are doing consulting and so much or doing research in the area, you know, let me know. We can set up more circles to keep the, the dialogue going. So that's kind of the part I'm focusing on and developing this training uh, of the definition. If you're interested in that, you know, we could talk about any collaboration. So that's me, uh, Leanne. What? You're muted. <laughs> and there, oh, when I unmute. Sorry. Um, my mind's going a mile a minute. It's thank you so much for inviting me to be in, a part of this. Um, yeah, definitely. What what Wayne was saying. There's 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 something there. I have to have a bit of a think about what that is, but there's something there that, yeah like even just a topic of the role of empathy and leadership and getting a bunch of CEOs to do an empathy circle about the role of empathy and leadership, um, I think would be quite interesting with, I wouldn't facilitate it. Um, I don't know what my role would be, just a participant. Um, but yeah, lots and lots of food for thought, lots of food for thought. And thank you for this opportunity. Okay, and maybe we just take like 30 seconds as sort of a wrap up, like how was the experience, uh, Wayne, today? Um, I, I, this has been fantastic as far as I'm concerned. We've, we've had Edwin that's done more of these that you can shake a hot stick at. Um, I've had the opportunity to reflect at a deeper level, <coughs> a, a sort of a, quite a research level, and, and I'm just totally engaged with Empathy Circles. And Leanne yourself is... It's been absolutely awesome watching your aha moments as your eyes have sort of darted backwards and forwards and, and your fingers have gone, something <laughs> up, something, something's thinking. Um, that's what I enjoy most of Empathy Circles is not what people say, but what people are showing their, it's almost seeing a sea change inside their mind. Um, 
So that's what drives me about empathy circles. Um, and yeah, thank you again for the opportunity, Edwin. You're doing fantastic work. Um, and hopefully, uh, Leanne, you want to go and put something together and, and have some cunning plans. Yes. Well, how was it for you, Leanne? What was your takeaway so, experience? So initially, um, I have that skeptic hat on of going, oh, this is going to be uncomfortable and I don't know what I'm doing and I'm going to say the wrong thing and I'm done. I'm, I'm going to mess this up and make a fool of myself. I don't think I did that. I feel like it was a safe enough space to, to play with my ideas. And so in coming up with new connections in my brain, I went, oh, okay, okay, this makes this makes sense. I get this. Um, so I feel like I've been on a little bit of a journey that I would expect other people to be on as well of, huh, I don't know. I It's not what I'm used to, but yeah, now going, okay. Because when I talk empathy, we talk care, listen, understand, connect. And I feel like we've kind of gone the listen, understand. And then the third bit, we've got to now start to do the connection piece, which is all right, what were the emotions that were going on? What did I feel? And do that reflection piece after of going, why did I think it was uncomfortable? And why did I? So to go through that was lovely. It's, um, yeah, it was outside my comfort zone, but thank you. <laughs> mm, great. Well, I, I just, I enjoy just connecting with others in the, in the, in the field of empathy and start developing connections that, I feel a real sense of connection uh, with both of you and look forward to carrying that forward to, uh, you know, for me, it's about the, it's a, it kind of contributing to humanity with whatever life I have left. And I think that a, a culture of empathy, a, a culture that values empathy is just going to just lead to much greater well-being, uh, you know, to humanity. And, you know, that's, I, I feel a sense of that, that contribution as well as the, the, just the, the richness that each of you have brought, the emotional and humanity. So there's, a, there's just an enlivening of my life uh, just by, you know, spending this time with you. So grateful for that. And to be continued, we'll do more of these. You know, I'm doing, this is an ongoing series. I hope to maybe do one a week, you know, with different activists. We can do the same activist, mix and match, you know, connect with other uh, people who are doing workshops, who are doing academic work, who are, you know, promoting trainings and so forth. So this is to be uh, continued. So with that, we're right on time. So uh, thank you so much and uh, see you next time. And uh, Leanne, once you've, uh, once you've had time to think and, and the, the mind is settled, Reach it back out to me, and we'll uh, yeah. we'll, we'll we'll see what's next. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thanks, okay, right. thanks, Edward. Bye. Bye, Bye, Leanne.